we're back with another what we read it's been a couple of weeks and we have a lot of books to talk about so we will get right into it but first let me just give a shout out to the shop Ram and Cozy who gave me the shirt. It's their Saturday Night Cozy shirt. It's very soft, the material is very thin. I love the way that this neckline falls. I like that he's petting it and like the design itself is very very cute. As you can see, it's perfect for me. Um, if you it want to soft. check out their shop, if you want to check out their shop, uh, I will link to that down below. They just released their new collection, and they also just updated their website. So be sure to check that out. Now, moving on to the books, I have quite a few books to share with you guys. So we're just gonna roll right into that. First is a series. I haven't read the entire series, but I read the first three novels and the novella that comes after those. So it's a series called The McGregor Brothers by Karina Hale, and the books are The Pact, The Offer, The Play, and Winter Wishes. So The Pact is about best friends Steph and Lyndon, and they make this pact when they're around 26, I wanna say, 25, 26, that if they can't find anyone to get married to or that they're in love with, uh, they're gonna end up married at 30. One of those. And then The Offer is about Steph's friend Nicola and Lyndon's brother Bram and Nicola is a single mom and she's kind of having a hard time and Bram is someone that everyone sees as like a player who doesn't really take life seriously but really he's more than that and so they have a thing and the third book is about their cousin Lyndon and Bram's cousin Lachlan and Nicola and Steph's other friend Kayla and how those two end up sort of meeting because of their mutual connections obviously and they end up falling in love but Lachlan has a lot of issues he's dealing with from his past. So essentially all of these stories are romances, obviously. They each have varying degrees of drama and angst. The angstiest one is the play because Lachlan's history is very very difficult and I think it was really well done. It was just a lot angstier than what I'd normally read. And then we have, you know, the little bit more lighthearted. that's The Pact, which is really fun. All in all, Karina Hill is such a great writer. I really enjoy her stories on the whole. I'm glad I finally read the series. The Pact was actually a reread for me and I actually loved it way more this time around. There's just something about the way Karina Hale writes her characters that brings them to life really well and it kind of makes me want to root for them to have that happy ending even though they're also being obstinate and frustrating and you just <laughs> want to bonk their heads together sometimes. That was me a lot. Uh, it was really fun. Great transit reads because I read most of this while traveling. And yeah, it was all, all in all really enjoyable. My favorite in the series so far is The Offer, but that's probably because there is something particularly that happens at the end, I wanna say, of the book that I'm a big fan of. I'm not gonna spoil it, but like, I just, I knew that I was gonna end up loving the one. So there, awesome. that's my first. Alrighty, I'm gonna start my roundup with a couple of middle grade contemporary books. One of them is called, uh, uh, Secrets of Topsy, book one, a friendly town that's almost always by the ocean. And um, it's the cutest thing because um, just if basically the absurdity of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, just everything weird about it, were turned into an entire town. Fair. Right? Like Oompa Loompas, what a concept. Uh, that would be that would be Topsy. And our guy, Davy Jones, yes. Uh, no illusion to pirates, I'm so sad so far. Uh, he just happens to be named Davy Jones, and his locker just happens to be at the bottom of the pool. Because, you know, topsy. Um, he just moves there with his mom and tries to fit in. Uh, and so it's a great kind of reveal about, you know, why he moves, what's the point, uh, you know, what are the things that he sort of refuses to share about himself while trying to make friends and he finally does. So I just really like uh, how touching the story is, uh, because it's about as touching as the entire thing is as absurd. Uh, so, spoiler, yeah. spoilers, there are rock cats here. They're called rock cats because they sit on the rocks. Nobody owns them. Who owns rock cats, really? But they cats own us. True, but it's like the cats own the town and they smile with all of their teeth. So this has a special place in my heart. I really want to see if there are book twos, threes, fours, and fives. Uh, very cute. Um, this other book is called Charlie and Frog. Uh, it's about Charlie who moves in with his grandparents because his parents are too busy taking care of golden... I want to say moles. Badgers? Moles. Well, whatever. The point is that his parents are envi environmentalists uh, and they have to travel a lot. They kind of neglect him like for most of his life. So when we knew this town, he just feels kind of bereft of anybody liking him until a murder mystery seems to unfold in front. I know, a murder mystery. Because that's how people are going to Well, like you never you. know. Somebody, because a, a lady signed the word for death in um, an ASL, American Sign Language, and um, he thought, thought, my gosh, somebody must have died, yada yada, which connects him to 
Frog, who is one of the local um, kids uh, in his new town, who just happens to be uh, uh, one of the part of the deaf community. And her family owns like a deaf cafe because most of her family has that she get a genetic thing. And it's actually Frog who kicks the most ass in this book. <laughs> uh, that she just happens to be deaf um, is, is a great way to sort of tell a story where it doesn't really matter what you are and what disabled disabilities you have. It's your person and you're interesting and you're awesome and you're amazing. And Karen Kane is so close to the deaf community that she was able to do this. And um, I had fun kind of signing to a lot of the sign. You there's should a lot show of, them, yeah. You there's a lot them. of sign language in this book. And to the point where even the the, 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 end, the papers end papers have, have the, the, the letters, letters, which gave me a great review. I always forget like three or four letters. Really bad. And every chapter starts off with sort of like sign language stuff that they, you can kind of spell with. So I had fun signing uh, to this on the train. Um, so I love the characters. I don't think there's anybody like Frog out there right now anyway, deaf or otherwise. So that she happens to be deaf as well is a great way uh, to represent. And so I really had fun with, this, uh, with the, these two books. Thank you, Disney, for sending them over. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a couple of review books as well. The first one is The Secret Science of Magic by Melissa Keel, which was sent to me by Peachtree Publishing. This is a quirky YA contemporary, which is something I've really come to expect from Melissa Keel. I've read two of her other books, The Incredible Adventures of Cinnamon Girl, I want to say, and Life in Outer Space. And she's a Australian author, so all of her stories are set in Australia. Yeah. And it's just interesting like her take on her stories is always very unique from all the other contemporaries i read this one in particular is about a really 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 smart girl named sophia who maybe isn't so adept at social situations and then we have josh on the other side of this uh story and he has always been interested in sophia in a romantic Aww. sense but he's also kind of awkward and a little bit different from everyone else he's an amateur magician among other things. Oh, that's cool. Um, and the entire story is really just Sophia learning to navigate real life and real life relationships and the changes that come with, you know, graduating from school and moving on to university and all of that. And, you know, Josh is also attempt to woo this girl and it's it's really cute like it took me a little while to get used to the way that it was narrated because these characters are so specific in voice and tone but that's not a terrible thing at all it's actually really great because it's easy to distinguish them and i liked it a lot it's another one where i would say it's like on the quieter side of the YA spectrum because it's a very simple story but it's really enjoyable and then after that, I read a story called Summer of Salt, and this one is by Katrina Leno. This is the story of twins Georgina and I want to say Mary, and they live on this island where the island is known for this one particular species of bird. Hmm. And that bird is connected to their family because supposedly that is one of their great grandmothers, great great grandmothers turned into a bird. Anyway, their family has uh, magical abilities, all the women in the family. Anyway. Cool. And it's this really great contemporary story, but it's also got the, that magical realism aspect to it. And Georgina is trying to make peace with the fact that she's leaving this island that has been her home all her life, and she's going off to college, and she's trying to make you know peace with the fact that she and her sister are gonna be separated. She hasn't developed the magical abilities in her family, and she's almost 18, which is when the cutoff age is. And there's just a lot going on in this one life-changing summer, Particularly when that species of bird goes missing and no one knows what's going on and so it sends everyone into a tizzy and I ended up really drawn into the story. It's it's so simple in plot and execution, but it's so compelling like I couldn't stop reading the way that Lena wrote Georgina's voice was really great and I immediately warmed to her. So it was really good. I was really surprised by how much I liked it. Um, while it's not necessarily something I think I need to revisit, I think it's definitely well worth at least reading once. And then I read this book called Ace of Shades by Amanda Foodie, and it's the first in a series <laughs> called The Shadow Shades. Game. It's about two main characters. We have N, who arrives at New Reigns, which is basically like a city filled with casinos and the mafia and oh, hey, all yeah, of that, yeah, you know, yeah. stuff. I you and she's there because she's trying to figure out what happened to her mother and where her mother's gone because her mother's missing. And she is left with no choice but to partner with Levi, who is one of the leaders, one of the gang lords, and he's also at the head of an investment scam and he's trying to, you know, figure out how to fix it. And it's like this. At first I thought it was just going to be like this story where it was like quick and like things would happen but it's actually more than that because the two of them turn out to be players that are being manipulated in a bigger conspiracy and it's 
really good. I was very surprised by how much I enjoyed that one and I'm really looking forward to the next one. Next we have a book called Nine Days and Nine Nights which is by Katie Cotugno and it's a sequel to 99 Days which is my favorite Katie Cotugno book of all time. And it focuses on Molly uh, a year after the events of 99 Days and she's trying to make peace with what's gone on and she's now on a trip around Europe with her boyfriend Ian. Only the trip doesn't quite go as planned when she runs into her ex-boyfriend Gabe yeah. and his new girlfriend and then because of circumstances they end up traveling together and what? so she's forced to revisit all of these like unresolved what? feelings. It's so good. I was so surprised <laughs> okay. because I... I mean, I love 99 Days, like I said, so I was kind of concerned about how 9 Days and 9 Nights would be, but I shouldn't have worried because Katie Kadungno just, she knows how to write a story. Plus, with the added bonus of like the European setting, it was pretty darn fun, especially since I read that one on the plane back from London. And the last one in this section before I let Mackie take over again is a book called Brooklyn in Love by Amy Thomas. It is another memoir from Amy. She wrote a book called Paris My Sweet, which I loved because it's about all the dessert places that she went to in oh. New York and Paris and it's amazing. Um, Brooklyn in oh, Love is sort of like that, but she also includes restaurants. And what's nice is it's centered in New York, so all of the restaurants are places that we could actually potentially visit. I don't quite find like the personal anecdotes as charming as I did with the first book but it was still enjoyable overall and I definitely have like a ton of restaurants and cocktail bars and oh, all of that that I really want to try. There, like, yeah exactly. No. So those uh, are uh, the first of my review books in this haul. Awesome. I'm gonna segue to some of my kindledge. Kindledge. That's not a real word. Or maybe it is now. No, it's, it's a real word for you. It's a real oh, word for me. Um, I'm not going to do the entire review now, but let me, I'm going to start with um, Her Mad the Her Majesty's Dragon series, uh, Temeraire. Did you pick it up by, again? By Naomi Novik. Yeah, I sort of picked it up again. I absolutely stopped at book seven. I think I got... You know, seriously, I binged one but that's to... that's like a legit... I binged binge. one to like one to, 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 to a fourth of the seventh book for like a series of a few months last year. Yeah, that's and a then commitment it just, though, because those are really Exactly, and then it just stopped because I think um, things went south for me when Temrir and his, you know, kind of, uh, and, and Captain Lawrence, his kind of writer, uh, went south, literally to Australia. Yeah, that's, that's a little spoiler, but that they... Apparently, I don't like historical fiction unless it involves dragons. So, <laughs> so I will do a review of the entire Terror series uh, when I do my Dragon Books Roundup. No, oh, yeah, uh, that's definitely pretty soon. Guys. So I'm sort of just uh, uh, picking up books there. But <clears throat> I finally finished book seven. Like, finally, just slugged through it, and, and it's done. And I have to say that I'm glad I did because now I really want to know what happens in the next book, which I'm all currently reading right now. I put this book together with, uh, in this section with the I Am Number Four series books <laughs> that just recently came out because I honestly feel like if Naomi Nova can get uh, set nine books of the same freaking dragon, which I love by the way, Temeraire is awesome. He is a Chinese uh, celestial breed dragon, something that has never been seen outside of China, but for some happenstance of faith, uh, it hatches for a lowly mm -hmm. British soldier who is not so lowly anymore now that he has the rarest gem of the British armada, which is celestial dragon. See, you know, and they're fighting Napoleon still for nine books, I want to say. So, I would never read up on Napoleon unless it involved dragons. So you got the French dragons, you got the British dragons, now you got the Chinese dragons. What's not to love? If Naomi Nova can have a world to play. I like how we went all the way back to Naomi Nova. Now we're gonna yeah, sing. Exactly. How did you have a world to play with the same friggin' dragon, which I love to death. They're very stately and British, by the way. British dragons, who knew? Um, <laughs> right? I'm sorry, the voices are in my head. I am so glad that Pinnacus Lore, I don't know who he is. I'm. For any for any I am number four lovers out there, can you holler at us from the comments if you know like who Pitticus Lore is the same way we know who Brandon Sanderson really is? Shout out to the Smedry clan. That's right, Sanderson. We know who you are. Um, but the, the, but the Pitticus Lore books are just there's so much. There's the main series of, of like nine ish ten ten ish books of the main series with number four and all mm -hmm. of the, the rest of the lore of the Loric alien all the novellas. kids and then there's all the novellas which, of which i've read half and then now after the giant war and this is where the new books come in after the giant war that changes the fate of the entire universe it ends on earth and people are picking up the pieces now there are so many loric there's so many kids who now have loric powers mm -hmm. 
they're putting up a school, very Xavier school, but kind of creepy, but it's a semi-half government. Okay. And that's what Generation 1 is all about. I didn't think that I would care about people who were not Lori originally, but the fact that it focuses on some of the survivors from the war who were given, human kids who were given powers, um, as sort of a leaping off point, and then they meet new kids at the academy, I didn't expect that it would be great. I'm hooked. I, I love these. I love these kids. They're amazing. To my surprise, and so in true Pitaka's lore fashion, there's the main series, and then there are novellas that come out that happen at the same time, mm -hmm. uh, which is Out of the Ashes and Into the Fire. There's two more books in the series, and they focus on number six. For those of you who love number six, she made a cameo in the movie that never existed. She was awesome. She's part of. I'm sorry, she is. And no, Sam, Sam, for his friend Sam, John Smith's good old friend Sam, uh, and and six are traveling the world now, uh, and and are involved in parallel things. So I just love this, these, these. You know, obviously the Pitocus lore a bit more enjoyable than the British dragons. The, nothing against the Brits, the Brit dragons, but the, you know these aliens are awesome, and uh, I just can't get enough. Clearly, highly recommend for any I'm number four fans clearly can't get enough. Okay, back to my review books. The next one I'm going to talk about is Pictures in the Light, which is by Kelly Lloyd Gilbert. This is about a boy named Danny Chang who is an artist that just got accepted into the Rhode Island School of Design, which is his dream school. And he's going to leave on full scholarship and it looks like everything is going to turn out great for him but then he finds out that his parents have been keeping this secret from him for most of his life all of his life really and things kind of spiral out of control from there and so Danny is really left to question a lot of things about who he is what he wants about his parents about his relationships and it's a very slow read or it was for me because the voice is so distinctive and the way it's written it's just kind of one of those books where you just have to take it in a little at a time because it's so heavy, there's so much going on. But that didn't diminish the fact that it was still a story that I was invested in and wanted to find out what was going to happen by the end of it. And the way it plays out felt like the only way it could play out. And I, I really just, I think like the sheer emotion and honesty in the way that Danny's story was portrayed was really really well done so even though I can't give this one a general recommendation because I don't think it's gonna work for everyone the way it did for me I I genuinely liked it and I thought it was a good story the next book that I read was from Twinkle with Love which is Sanya Manon's sophomore novel it's about an aspiring filmmaker named Twinkle who is commissioned to do a film for her school's midsummer festival and she's commissioned by one of her own classmates Sahil Roy who is an aspiring film critic or he actually does it online so I guess he's an actual film critic and so these two work together and Twinkle finally feels like she's being seen by her peers and not just a wallflower but that sort of thing can sort of mess with your head a little and that's what happens to Twinkle in this story. Also, there's a budding romance there on the side, but I guess you guys already knew that just based on the two characters that I highlighted. I really enjoyed Twinkle by the end of it. I got very emotional while reading it because it's just... Twinkle isn't necessarily a character that I immediately liked. She has a lot of growing up to do in this story and she does it by the end of the novel, which is why I was like, it felt so satisfying to get to the ending. But um. It was still such a fun contemporary to read. I love the whole like aspiring filmmaker side of things where she, she they actually went out and got professional costumes and they got all this equipment and they were doing this thing and the film that they decided to do for the Midsummer Festival is also really great. I just think that Sandy Minon really has a knack for writing characters that are real and flawed and you know you can also see that their progress they're growing from one thing into another especially as a teen is very very realistic this book is also written in letter format so it's it's basically twinkle writing letters to different filmmakers all female and i thought that format was interesting it did give me a little bit of distance from twinkle herself which is probably why i wasn't as invested in this one as i was with manon's first novel um but it was still a good story all in all and i ended up quite enjoying it Moving right along, we have another contemporary. I read a lot of contemporaries this month, in case you were wondering. Mm -hmm. um, we have Love Songs and Other Lies by Jessica Pennington. This one is basically, at its heart, a second chance romance story between nah. two characters who were in love a couple of years ago and then who are reunited unexpectedly when the main girl character, Virginia, joins her best friend on tour only to discover that her best friend has hired the guy that she used to be in love with or had fallen huh. in love with to be part of the band. So 
Oh yeah, I remember you yeah, ranting about it, this, yeah. It, 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 I'm sorry, as someone who loves boy band fanfiction, and still does, <laughs> and used to write it, this is sort of like that, except obviously it's like, different in the sense that the characters have this whole like, thing going on for them that's unrelated to the music side of things. Um, I just, I, I liked it a lot. The way it's told is that it alternates between two characters, Virginia, the girl, and Cameron, the guy. And it also alternates between timelines. So there's present day, and then there's the past when they first started getting to know each other. And I think it was a really well orchestrated move to do that because it sort of reveals to you little by little how they got to the point where they had to break up and be apart. But it also shows you how they're recovering from it. And it's just so fun. And I just love how it ended. It made me so happy. Because, you know, we can all predictably guess how this one probably ends, but the execution of it was still pretty great. So I enjoyed this one a lot. Would recommend checking it out if you like music and if you like contemporary second chance romances. <laughs> uh, the next book is also sort of a contemporary romance, I guess. It's a book called Royals by Rachel Hawkins. This one is about a girl named Daisy and she is really like the kind of person who doesn't want to be in the spotlight. Unfortunately, she is going to be in the spotlight because her older sister is engaged to the Crown Prince of Scotland. Wow. So when Daisy finds herself getting, you know, picked up by the tabloids for like the weirdest things because just because she's, she's the, Ellie's sister, yeah. she ends up having to spend the summer in Scotland to like sort of, you know, for good press coverage and learn what it's like to be related to or connected to the royal family and of course it's a summer full of shenanigans and all of the things that royals are expected to do and Daisy kind of has to learn what she's willing and not willing to do for this and it's just it was really fun first of all like again it's one of those stories where like you kind of know that a lot of the things in there are gonna be a little over the top but that's okay because it's still enjoyable there is a lot of like bantery stuff in this book. There's a lot of really cute like little scenes between her and some of the other characters and I ended up really enjoying it. It's not like my new favorite book but I would definitely read it if there was a sequel because the guy main character in this one, totally my type. The second to the last book that I'm showing you guys today is a book called Ash Princess by Laura Sebastian. This one came out just this week actually. Mm -hmm. It's about a girl named Theodosia who is the heir to a kingdom that no longer exists. Basically, when she was a child, conquerors came in and slaughtered her mother, who was the queen, and took over everything. It's terrible. And now she's living as their, I guess, their pet slash their like object of ridicule at the palace. They call her Thora now, and she's made to wear like a crown of ashes, hence Ash Princess. That's terrible. At the beginning of the story, Thora seems very resigned to her life and what, you know, what sort of life she's been living until now and um she there's an incident that occurs right at the beginning of the book that sets her off on a very different path where she realizes that she wants to die fighting for her country and her people mm. and even though it takes a lot of courage and a lot of smarts and it also means that she has to face the things she wasn't able to face before that's basically her journey through the entire book just figuring out a way to manipulate the situation in her favor to escape the king's clutches and to you know deal with her enemies as best she can considering she has no kingdom, no manpower, nothing. Essentially, like the bare bones of the story is pretty solid. It's very recognizable and familiar in the sense that a lot of YA fantasies play out the same way. So if you've read quite a few, you'll probably find it a little bit predictable. Um, the hard part of this one is like, you're expected to root for Theodosia from the start. And it's kind of hard to do that because you don't no. really feel like, the way it's done, I, I don't know, personally I just didn't feel very connected to her and that kind of colored my experience of this entire book. Because I couldn't really get behind her and her cause, so... Uh. Like, be, uh, more past the superficial level is what I mean. Like, of course, like, you want, like, the underdog to win and, like, you want her to get, like, her kingdom back. And I like that she was never portrayed as being the good one, like, completely, because she had to do a lot of things in order to get to where she is at the end of the book. Hmm. Um, I, it was okay. Like it was, it was, uh. it was, it was a decent read. And like by the end of it, I was like, yeah, this is picking up. This is getting interesting. But I wouldn't necessarily say it was as good as I thought it was going to be. I thought I was going to fall in love with this book, but I kind of didn't. Um, I know that this one has gotten like a 
variety of opinions. It's across the spectrum, really. Some people felt similarly to me, and there are other people who actually really enjoyed it. So if the story sounds intriguing to you, maybe pick it up. Another thing that I want to comment on is the writing style, because that's also the thing that kind of didn't work for me. It was just like the way things were phrased and said that I was kind of like, oh, all right. Um, but yeah, I, I, this is one of those books where I, it's really just down the middle for me. I don't know if I'm reading the sequel, we'll see. But yeah, it, it was a solid read. So I guess if you're interested, check it out for yourself and then you can tell me if you liked it or not. Cool. All right, Mackie's turn for now. The last set of books that I ah. eventually read, I am so glad that I did. Um, it is the- you need to get the rest of those, dude. Yeah, I have it on Kindle. Um, here's the thing. You we need to get the rest of those. <laughs> it's pretty. It is though. <laughs> so um, this is part of the, the three middle grade books that uh, Disney up here in had. Uh, is it really? Yeah, okay. yeah, it's absolutely middle grade. Um, and I and I and I and I must say this about middle grade books um, uh, that I love. All of the middle grade books that I love have the following things: a very very strong set of leads, mm -hmm. a very very brilliant kind of lore, mm -hmm. a really, really fast paced and not draggy, but very complex enough kind of plot. And but but and, and this book has that in spades. What it but what most middle grade books don't have is a very satisfying ship. This to me personally, ships. especially if you don't like your ships like on the nose. <laughs> like if you like your ships sort of just like, oh my gosh, are they? But are they not? But no, they're totally you know what I mean? then this is the book series for you. More importantly, this is the only series that I've read in a long time. This is the Shadow Magic series. Burning Magic was the third. We got it in the mail. I thought, hey, you might as well just read the first two, check it out in the library. But I thought, yeah, I might as well just buy it on Kindle. Why not? It looks pretty interesting. No regrets. Um, and this is the only book series that I know where there is a very, very strong male lead. Somebody who might as well be kind of like, you know, we're talking strongly in the in the in the vein of John Wick. You know what I mean? It's like he's just cool. And then a very strong female lead. Both of them share center and none of their activities undercut the other strength. To me that's so rare. Strong female characters usually are strong to the detriment of the males. Or, and vice versa. And, and you know, or, or worse, very strong uh, women can be set up and then the male does something that undercuts that. So so it's there, so I find it very rare that uh, you have a strong female lead who wins the day on her in her own way, who gets help from the guy, but doesn't get undercut. And the lore is amazing. Um, tip, tip, it, it, it's it's you know middle grade. Um, I want to say gourmet lore. I believe it's it should be up there with the likes of Rick Riordan and Damon Pierce and all that stuff. Uh, interesting enough, um, when I geeked out uh, about book one, the author Joshua Khan um, actually sort of commented and say, "Hey, you should read Burning Magic." And it was like that's exactly where I'm reading the first book. Shadow Magic was awesome. Uh, and for and for those of you who really want to know, it's about her. Uh, the the girl's name is Lily Shadow. She inherits the entire kingdom of Gehenna because her uh, her family is slaughtered and now she has to rule. The rules of this entire world are n no women can wield magic, but she is the strongest that their family has produced in a while. So she has to study this magic secretly, the, which is inherited for the family line. And uh, the other member is, uh, the other character is Thorn. Uh, he's from far, far away, but he gets rope a doped into all of the shenanigans. Um, and so I absolutely recommend this this uh, this book. Um, I am in talks with Joshua Khan, who sort of geeked out back and forth and sort of doing it like an author uh, interview slash kind of geek out session. Yeah. So we're just giving him all of the time that he needs to fill out yeah. my 20 billion questions. Um, of which I told you him- You would have 20 million. Of which I told him, hey man, you just you can disregard any of this and just talk about anything you want. Because I love this book series like so, so much. Um, I feel like he should get as many books as Naomi Novik and uh, Pitticus Lore because I would read Thorn and Lily going to the grocery to buy milk. And you know how they're gonna get there? There is a character in this book called Hades. He is a giant bat. I'm gonna let that sink in. Hades, the giant bat, who will take crap from no one. That's all you need. So, love this book. Please get it. It's amazing. Tell all of your friends. Get the whole series. Get the entire series. We will too. So, oh, we're going to, because I'm not reading it on Kindle. It was so It was so good, I actually got the third book on Kindle as well. So. Mackie, like, oh, by the way, this is like a complete, like, side conversation but um Mackie has this thing where he prefers collecting ebooks and I tend to prefer collecting like 
actual books. And the only reason I do that is because I want to carry them everywhere I go. Meanwhile, I'm just like, put my shelves. They won't look pretty without them. Which is fine. And that's, it's just me. I think I'm we like, both have very valid concerns in life. It's like, I'm on the train. I can read anything I want. <laughs> okay. So. Actually, that's, it's great that Mackie's also leaving off on a high note because the book that I'm going to share next is actually one of the best books I have read so far in 2018, which I'm very glad about. I had been looking forward to this one for some time when it was first announced, and then when I finally read it, I was like, okay, it lived up to and pretty much surpassed my actual expectations. The book in question is Sky in the Deep by Adrian Young. It is a Viking story. Mm -hmm. It centers around a girl named Elin, and she has been raised all her life as an Aska warrior. And the Askas, as part of their tradition, I guess, in their history, they have always been at war with this other clan called the Riki. And every year, at least I think it's once a year, they meet on the battlefield and, you know, proceed to slaughter each other until whoever wins. Tradition. Uh, but this year, when Elin goes to fight in that battle, she actually sees her brother, her brother who is supposed to be dead for like huh. the past five years, and he's with the Riki. What? So it, when she, you know, follows her curiosity, because she, she loved her brother, obviously, and she wants to know what the hell he, he's doing here alive and with On the other enemy, side. Um, she ends up getting captured by the Riki and taken to their home village. And it's there where she starts to realize that the Riki are maybe not quite the enemy that they're portrayed to be. And it's it's just a really good story. I love that it is it has got both like the intense battle action scenes and there are a lot of great sequences where Elin is just like killing it as a warrior. But there's also a lot of quieter moments where you see that Elin is slowly starting to realize that maybe what she's been told and taught all her life isn't necessarily the only truth that exists. And so she has to figure out that truth for herself as well. And it's really good. It's a standalone novel, so it ends on a on very strong note, really. Um, and it concludes like the story itself, and I like that a lot. And it never felt like it was dragging, even when during the whole time when she was like captured and you know all of the things that happened while she's at the Riki village. I think it was just cool because she really did a good job of like putting the action and intrigue in there and putting the emotional growth in there, but also just giving you like an everyday glimpse of what life was like for people in this time and age. And it was just, it was just so good. Like everything about it was great. The characterization, the emotional beats, the relationships, the story. So I genuinely really, really like this one. I would highly recommend checking it out. I will let you, I will let you guys in on what the, uh, the little like blurb, blurb thing says. It's part Wonder Woman, part Vikings and all heart. All heart. <laughs> So um, yeah, it's it's really good. I really enjoyed it. I can't wait to see what Adrian Young does. Blah, blah, blah. I can't wait to see what Adrian Young does next. And there you have it. Those are all the books that we have read so far since the last time we did the, uh, one of these. I don't even remember when that was, to be honest. Ah. It was a while back. Anyway, I'm really happy because it's spring now. Um, I don't know if that will be a good thing or a bad thing for my reading. So I guess we'll find out. But uh, well, Claritin to death. So. <laughs> but yeah. So what have you guys been reading? Please, please tell us if you've been reading anything that has just come out or anything off the backlist. We also, I am number four fans. Oh yeah. Any of you out there? I'm sure there are more out there. Holler at this, well, me. <laughs> I'm not caught up. I've only read the first three, I think. It's so good. But um, yeah, so there. We'll see you guys in our next video. Bye.